Well, the full title of the report is Nuclear Weapons Are Banned. What does this mean for Britain? And I'll start by saying a bit of the context. The first sentence of the executive summary is nuclear weapons continue to threaten the world with nuclear war and terror. And the first sentence or couple of sentences of the um, of the introduction are as humanity struggles to address the enormity of what we must change to avoid further deadly pandemics and the worst outcomes of climate destruction, nuclear risks and the specter of nuclear war are on the rise again. And these two points are really fundamental to why it's so important that we're taking on this issue and that we recognize that this is one of the, you know, existentially threatening issues to our lives and survival in the 21st century. There are over 13,000 nuclear weapons still in the possession of the nuclear armed states, of which there are now nine. Uh, also, we know that regional and international relations between uh, some, if not all, of those nuclear armed states are deteriorating, uh, and, and, it, and they've been deteriorating for the last two decades. We know that nuclear weapons can, in fact, be dismantled and got rid of, because 50,000 nuclear weapons were removed, dismantled, destroyed since the INF Treaty, the, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty of 1987, the one that we were working so hard to, on down at Greenham Common and up here in Scotland. Um, and, uh, but those reductions have practically stopped. And instead, what we're seeing are new upgraded warheads and missiles being developed, including here in the UK. And we pick, particularly see this in the um, 2021 uh, Integrated Review of Security, Defense, Development and Foreign Policy, what I've called in the, in the report IR 2021, which increases the risks of nuclear use and proliferation by widening the circumstances in which nuclear weapons can be used and raising the ceiling on the nuclear arsenal of the UK by 40%, as well as other steps that undermine the UK's previous commitments on transparency, nuclear disarmament, and verification. Um, yeah, and from the UN uh, Secretary General's office right through to the Archbishop of Canterbury, deep concerns were raised about this. Um, from right across the world and also from uh, other states parties within the non-proliferation treaty. So that's also a, an important part of the context. Now, what does this report do? Well, chapter one gives a commentary, a detailed article by article commentary on the TPNW text, uh, its relevant negotiating history and the implications of some of the decisions and choices that were made. Chapter two analyzes the evolution and changes in UK nuclear policies, going back actually quite a long way, but particularly focusing on the period from 2006, when the decision was brought, it brought up in the white paper by the Labour government of Tony Blair uh, about renewing Trident. And uh, this is when I came up and started living in Scotland for a couple of years as part of the coordinating team for FASLANE 365, because we knew that so much depends on what happens in Scotland as to whether they can do this or not. And that was, a, that, you know, getting in, living in Scotland and then getting involved really in, in direct action of Faz Lane. And what were they talking about? They weren't talking about arms control. They were talking about the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. They were talking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They were talking about um, preventing any use of nuclear weapons, preventing the accidents, preventing the risks. And it just really woke me up to recognize that that's what we had to focus on to get to the next stage 
of nuclear disarmament and that the obvious next stage of nuclear disarmament was getting a treaty that would ban nuclear weapons to focus on that that's why we call um this whole process a humanitarian uh, banning, you know, a humanitarian disarmament process, because it focuses on taking the value away, on stigmatizing, on banning the weapons. And in the case of this treaty, it bans the use and the threat of use, because what is deterrence but threatening to use nuclear weapons um, by doctrine and therefore by practice, because to do that, you have to make the weapons, you have to deploy them, you have to uh, have all kinds of nuclear policies, you've got to be assisted in all kinds of different ways. And every time those nuclear weapons go out on, on deployment, they are a nuclear war waiting to happen by intention or accident. So <clears throat> that's really what chapter two tries to, 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 to kind of show. Chapter three looks at um, uh, it look, looks at five scenarios that uh, in discussion with, with some of you, we felt that these were the ones that would, could, would or could pressure political change in the UK. And starting with security and economic imperatives. Now that ought to be the sole reason, you know, for pressure to get rid of nuclear weapons, shouldn't it? You know, what is right for our security and can we afford it? And not only are nuclear weapons completely wrong for any aspect of security, you cannot protect anyone with nuclear weapons against any of the security threats. In fact, nuclear weapons are not an asset for security. They are a problem and a threat. And we can't afford them. The economic pressures, we should be putting all those resources and the skilled workforce into you know, green energy into tackling climate destruction, into tackling um, pandemics and so on. So that's what that scenario is looking at. The second one is the one that I can remember at Green and we constantly were told, oh, you'll never get nuclear disarmament unless somebody uses nuclear weapons or unless there's another dreadful accident like Chernobyl. Well, that may be true and it's known as the sh shock theory of change, but actually I argue that we partly have created the shock by uh, the process of getting this treaty being focusing people's attention on the humanitarian catastrophe that would occur if nuclear weapons are used, focusing them on the risks, on the nuclear dangers, on all the things that could go wrong and frankly probably will go, well, some of them have already gone wrong. We've been pulled back from the brink many, many times. And if sorry, we carry Rebecca. on having nuclear weapons, we're not going to get past it. I'm sorry, so Rebecca, third... two more minutes. Got it. Thank you. So the third um, was uh, decisions by Scottish voters to go nuclear free and independent. And I'm sure I'm going to get quite a few questions on that. The fourth was um, what happens if NATO partners start to join the treaty? You know, people like to join things if their friends are doing so. And what are the implications and some of the arguments around the pressures on NATO here and now? And finally, <laughs> the last, which again should be, you know, relevant, elections develop, deliver parliaments and governments that are able to carry out nuclear disarmament and accede to the treaty. And then chapter four really owes a huge amount to John Ainsley of Scottish CND, um, really looks at his research and just summarizes some of it uh, on the stages, the requirements, the possible timelines that a UK roadmap for disarmament would entail. As to recommendations, there are five key. Now, obviously, we all really want the recommendation to be UK, get rid of Trident, cancel Trident, cancel the renewal, get rid of it and... Um, um, uh, join the, the, you know, sign and join the, 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 the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and, you know, contribute skills to verification and disarmament. But we've decided to focus on the fact that the, on, on, on the recommendations, because when we know the government in the UK is not ready, that they have existing legal obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the, the NPT. So what they need to start doing in earnest, in good faith, is taking the steps that in nuclear disarmament, um, we can talk a little bit about what those are, to comply with their disarmament and non-proliferation commitments. 
The second one is for the Westminster and Scottish parliaments to undertake separate parliamentary investigations to determine what would be entailed in pursuing nuclear disarmament and joining the TPNW. And I hope we can talk about that in a bit more detail. The yeah, three sure. more, um, sh very short recommendations. There's participation in the first meeting of states parties. It's currently still scheduled for March of 2022. It may end up being, being postponed, but we don't know that yet. We are, we're calling on the UK to apply and attend as an observer. And we're calling on members of parliament. And we know that some Scottish members of parliament are going, we really hope there'll be more. I think Bill Kidd uh, is going. I think Kirsten Oswald uh, had said something about going. So participation in the first meeting of states parties is the third recommendation. The fourth is one that would be music to many of your ears because you're already doing it. And it's the role of civil society and elected representatives and to know that we can exert real influence and we can do that through the nuclear free cities and we making more and more of them and we can do that through divestment don't bank on the bomb and the churches uh, together uh, investment program and so on and finally it's just one for Scotland uh, is I'd like to see the Scottish Government consider reconvening the Scottish Government Working Group on Scotland Without Nuclear Weapons that brought together activists, um, including myself as I was living in Scotland then, academics uh, like William Walker and others, uh, trades unionists, quite a few trade unionists, um, uh, the churches, faith leaders, and so on, uh, under the, being chaired by um, it was at that time Bruce Crawford, you know, a senior member of, um, of the Scottish Government. I think we need to have that now, and I think it needs to be done. That's got a separate brief, if you like, very Scottish-faced uh, focus brief, as well as that second recommendation that there should be a full parliamentary investigation with expert witnesses and so on. So I'll leave it there and open it up to, because I'm dying to hear what your questions are.